Welcome to our webinar on state-of-the-art architecture and future concepts in gun technology for power electronics. Um, this is the second session of the webinar series organized by CGD, and my name is Nare Gabrielian. I'm a product marketing manager at CGD, and I will be your moderator today. Um, I would like to start with some ground rules. Um, Lauren, if you may go to the next. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Next slide. Um, due to many participants, we ask you to keep your microphones muted and post your questions in the chat. I will read your questions at the end of the webinar for Florin to answer. Also, we are recording this session and the link to the rec recording will be available after the webinar. And now to present you the host of today's session, CGD's Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder, Professor Florin Udra. And Florin has worked on power devices for over three decades and has published over 600 papers and is an inventor of 200 patents in the field. In 2015, Florin was elected a fellow of Royal Academy of Engineering. So I do think we are in pretty capable hands today. Um, just to let you know, we will be having uh, hosting two more webinar sessions in April and May. And the first one will be focusing on quality and reliability, and then the second one will focus on applications. And now, Florin, I will hand it over to you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Nare. It's a privilege to um, give you uh, a webinar on behalf of Cambridge Gun Devices. Uh, before I start with um, the webinar itself, I would just like to give you the broad, uh, the broad picture of uh, gun devices of CGD. And uh, we are a fabulous semiconductor company. We span out of uh, Cambridge University and uh, we operate at the moment from five locations with the headquarter in Cambridge. Uh, we are very proud of our values and they are listed here, knowledge, innovation, sustainability and responsibility. And uh, we are aiming to support these values and enhance the culture in our business. Now I'll give you an introduction to the webinar itself. So in the next slide uh, here, there are three areas driving the growth of energy efficient solution. The first one is electrification, and we've seen the e-mobility disruption, um, which is um, really driven by energy efficiency regulation and CO2 reduction emission targets. Uh, renewable energies is an area that is going to grow a lot in the future. Wind and solar power are expected to account for 50% of the power mix by 2030 and as much as 85% by 2050. And last but not least, the connectivity. We have now big data, cloud computing, and 5G all in full uh, deployment and continue to grow very substantially. Now, what is important to say is that at the core of energy conversion and all the control systems used in these areas are the power semiconductors. And that's, that is the area that we operate in. Now, let's have a look at the properties of uh, silicon, um, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, diamond, and um, gallium oxide. Um, if you look at these uh, properties, uh, gun is somewhere in the middle with a band gap of 3.4 electron volts. It's not as high as diamond or gallium oxide, but it's three times or uh, largely three times that of silicon, and it's still higher than that of silicon carbide at 3.2 electron volts. Now, there is a direct relationship between the breakdown field, which is the critical electric field at which a material can break, um, between the electric field and the band gap. So the higher the band gap, the higher the critical electric field is. And again, GAN has a very uh, good um, value here with 3.3 megavolts per centimeter, which is, again, more than 10x of that of silicon, and is still higher than that of silicon carbide. In terms of the mobility, which is the second most important property in this table here, GAN is outstanding because it can achieve 2,000 centimeters square per volt second in the two-dimensional electron gas. Um, and there is no other material that can match this kind of mobility. One can look perhaps at the diamond. Diamond um, theoretically has about 4,500 centimeters square per volt second, but that is for intrinsic diamond without any doping at, at room temperature. Once any doping is present, the mobility goes down uh, very abruptly. It's also fair to say that um, there is no N-type 
uh, diamond today or very little research has been done in n-type diamond so you can almost discard this uh, value for diamond Coming back to gallium nitride, uh, the mobility together with very high uh, critical electric field makes a gun unique. There is another star property of gallium nitride, that's the saturation velocity, and this uh, saturation velocity um, matters more for the RF field. But in everything that you can see here, gun offers great advantages compared to uh, silicon and is beating silicon carbide in the major uh, properties. Um, interestingly, diamond is perhaps the best in terms of the electrical properties, but for reasons that I would uh, describe more in the next slide, there is no commercial success in diamond and there is very little appetite to, uh, from the industry to develop uh, diamond today. There is a very enthusiastic community nevertheless, and there will be research in the future, more research in the future in ultra wide band gap materials, including diamond. In terms of gallium oxide, Gallium oxide has an amazing property. It has a very high critical electric field, 8 megavolts per centimeter. However, we can also see very low thermal conductivity, much, much lower than silicon and silicon carbide and gun. And the mobility is also very poor, only 200 centimeters square per volt second. Now, um, material properties are definitely important, but when choosing uh, a material and a particular device in an application, we have to look at other uh, key aspects and system and technology aspects are also important. Now, the first one there is efficiency and performance. Uh, the second is the size and form factor of the device and also the system employing uh, that device. And then reliability is of manufacturing, infrastructure, cost, ease of use, and even diversity. They all matter. This table is uh, self-explanatory in the sense that green uh, whatever uh, is filled with green is good, whatever is filled with uh, dark brown or uh, red is uh, bad. You can see silicon is doing extremely well in terms of everything except efficiency performance and uh, size uh, form factor. Um, I have to say, I put this table many times in my presentations, and over the time, I filled more of these boxes with green for silicon carbide than gun, to the point that I almost filled everything with green for the gun, except diversity. Let's take, for example, the reliability. Reliability of gun was considered quite poor a few years back. Um, gun was um, perceived as being um, a selling problem with dynamic aron, which was um, called before current collapse. Um, it was also perceived as having very high leakage, especially the vertical leakage between the substrate and uh, the drain. But all these problems are now solved, and one single remaining issue re regarding uh, gate reliability has been addressed, as you will see in the next slide, and uh, our company has done a great deal for looking into um, improving the gate reliability of GAN. Diamond and gallium oxide, unfortunately, are not doing very well in many of the important categories like infrastructure, ease of manufacturing, ease of use, and also reliability on account, for example, of gallium oxide on the very poor thermal conductivity. Now, the timeline of introduction of modern power devices is quite interesting to see that uh, the development of power devices started quite early, not very far from the, from the invention of the transistor in 40s. The thyristor was developed in 1957, and we still have a form of a thyristor today. In fact, the GTO, the gate on of thyristor, or the, its evolution, the gate commutated thyristor, still are the main devices of choice for very, very high power applications, and for example, in applications like HVDC and tractions. Then we had the BJT, bipolar junction transistor, um, no longer is in the market today. Um, it's definitely a very, very niche uh, at the moment, but it used to be the cheapest power semiconductor device that could be produced. Now, the two main technology from silicon are the MOSFET and IGBTs developed in 70s and 80s, which have evolved into super junction MOSFET and field stop IGBT. Um, uh, respectively. Those were in the late 90s and the year 2000. But what has driven the market recently and what has been explosive in the power devices market recently is the presence, is the emergence of wideband gap technologies. And here we see um, in 2001 was the silicon carbide 600 volts uh, diode released, followed by the low voltage gun uh, normally off-hand 
than the 1.2 kV silicon carbide MOSFET and more recently the 650 volts uh, normally of GAN and now, the evolution from silicon power devices to silicon carbide power devices has been quite natural. If you are looking at the two pictures, the silicon on the left hand side and the gun on the uh, right hand side, we see that um, they both have very similar, um, they both have very similar structure. We are talking about bulk conduction and we are talking about a deep drift region that supports uh, the voltage. So the two technologies are very similar. Arguably, you see more of the trench MOSFET technology in silicon carbide, but trench uh, technology has been developed before for the silicon devices as well. What makes the difference is the fact that the silicon carbide has a much, much smaller drift region, 10 times smaller and 50 times more conductive. So that gives you a straight advantage of about 500 times. Now, in reality, the, the advantage is not quite five, uh, 500 times because the proportion of the overall on state resistance is also given by the channel resistance. Now, the channel resistance in silicon carbide is still inferior uh, to that in the silicon because the mobility at the interface between uh, the oxide and silicon carbide is only about 20 centimeters square per volt second, as opposed to that between silicon and oxide, which is 1000 centimeters square per volt second. Um, so the advantage is about 200 times and depends obviously on the uh, voltage range. Nevertheless, a very compelling advantage and that's why we see a major change now from silicon power MOSFETs and silicon IGBTs to silicon carbide um, power uh, MOSFET. The evolution from a lateral silicon power LD MOSFET to a lateral gun hand was not as natural, if you want, as the one uh, from uh, silicon vertical device to the silicon carbide vertical device. You can see the two devices are quite different. Both are lateral in the sense that they have the important uh, terminals, the source gate drain at the top of the device, and there is a substrate terminal at the bottom in both cases. However, on the left hand side picture, we have an end drift region and a bulk conduction of the current. Um, and we talk about bulk conduction to the drift region, while on the right hand side, we talk about conduction to a quantum layer, which is a two dimensional electron gas. Now, the left hand side, there is a single material, silicon material, while if you are looking at the gun hand, is a combination of different materials, starting with a silicon substrate, a transition layer, which is made of Algan gun materials, then a gun layer, then an algan, and having a piezo polarization charge at the gun and algan interface is what produces the two dimensional electron gas, which is now present between the source and the drain, and that can be modulated by the P gun uh, shot key gate. Now, this P gun shot key gate is possibly the most advanced of the gate technologies today in gun. Remarkably, we have a drift region in this case, which is 10 times smaller. So the dimensions of the gun uh, are so much smaller than the dimensions of the silicon. And we have a two dimensional electron gas, which is at least 20 times more conductive than the end drift region in the, in the um, LD MOSFET, in the reserve LD MOSFET uh, made in silicon. So that leads to a straight advantage of 200 times um, in terms of the uh, specific on state resistance. Now, the advantage, advantages of a lateral technology compared to the vertical technology um, are many, but the most important out of all these advantages is the fact that the lateral technology allows for monolithic integration of sensing and protection functions. And you can one can also integrate slurry control, the driver itself and the controller. And indeed, if you are looking at a silicon device on the left hand side, this is an example of a silicon power IC um, rated for 700 volts and um, operating at 10 watts. Um, and it had a PWM controller, it had uh, lots of other um, over temperature and over current protection functions. And uh, basically the on state resistance, specific on state resistance was in the range of 300 to 500 million centimeters square. Today we have a gun which is 
also going towards a power integrated circuit in the sense that besides the power device, we can integrate functions like current sensing, overgate voltage protection, ESD uh, protection circuits, and so on. But we are talking about specific on state resistances which are significantly smaller than in silicon, two, three million centimeters square as opposed to 300, 500 million centimeters square. And that allows GAN to be to operate at much higher power levels. So we can now extend the power IC technology to um, power levels of hundreds of watts and even um, up to 10, 20 uh, kilowatts. And I'm sure uh, in the near future, we'll be able to extend even before, uh, even beyond uh, this range. Now, the integration um, was in several steps. If you look at the integration uh, from a discrete to a monolithically integrated solution, the first step was in fact a hybrid integration, and that's putting two dyes in a chip, a silicon MOSFET in series with a depletion mode hand. And the advantage of this uh, technology, the hybrid integration, is that the silicon, in, the silicon offer an enhancement mode and it's an insulated gate, so it can be driven uh, just like a normal uh, silicon power MOSFET to 0 to 20 volts. It has high threshold voltage um, and it's offered good reliability, gate reliability. The disadvantage of this technology is that you have two dies in a chip. So there is already um, a, a sort of a assembly um, challenge by having two dies in a chip. Um, but there is also the presence of this uh, diet, which is in between um, in between the source and drain terminal of uh, the MOSFET in parallel with the MOSFET it itself. And this diet during the reverse recovery gives you some reverse recovery losses. These reverse recovery losses are not present in an enhancement mode, hence they are equal to zero. And that's one of the disadvantages of the hybrid solution. There are other, there are other uh, small problems, like for example, there is no uh, DV by DT control, there is no slew rate control with this technology, and um, also the total charge, the QSS, is actually larger than in the smart than in the uh, enhancement mode hand. Then we have two types of monolithic integration. What we call level one monolithic integration is what we do in Cambridge GAN devices, and level two monolithic integration is what other companies are doing. In um, level one integration, we are integrating a lot of uh, sensing and protection functions. Uh, we are integrating, for example, the current sense. Uh, we are integrating the um, gate over uh, voltage protection, and uh, we have an auxiliary gate hand. I will describe this in more details in the next slide, but just here we have an auxiliary gate hand, which allows basically for a higher threshold voltage and also allowing to drive the chip from the outside with zero to 20 volts, which is similar to what the Casco technology uh, does. Now, the total integration means that the entire driver is integrated with the um, with the power device. This obviously has the advantages of cutting the parasitics between the driver and the power device, but also has some disadvantages in the sense um, that the driver in gun technology is not ideal because it does not have a P-channel technology. It does not uh, have a bipolar structure, so you cannot use a simple totem pole, for example, driver. Um, in it. Nevertheless, it's an interesting solution as it, it's in the market uh, today. Now, um, it's exactly the right time to introduce uh, the ISGAN uh, technology, and let me walk you through this. Um, why we develop this technology is to address two remaining issues with GANM nitride. That's the ease of use and the gate reliability. So what we've done, if you are looking at the picture on the right hand side, this is a block diagram. We have monolithically integrating a series of functions which makes the gun more reliable and easier to use. So first of all, our gun can be uh, driven with any driver. So that allows the power electronics engineers to choose any driver, perhaps a driver that is matched to the controller, perhaps a, a silicon driver that is favorite um, for a certain uh, topology. And we do not need any sort of components outside our chip. We don't need any clamping circuits or any special circuits to create a negative voltage. We drive this device with any driver that can drive from zero volts to 20 volts. Um, how do we achieve that? Again, looking at the block diagram on the right hand side, 
Um, let's go through the function. First, we have added ESD protection to all the pins that can be exposed to some ESD events. Um, then second, we introduce an auxiliary hand with a voltage uh, limiter with a clamping uh, function. This auxiliary hand absorbs any voltage that is present on the outside gate um, so that it clamps the inner gate to a maximum of six volts. So let's remember that a classical uh, hand cannot operate beyond six, seven volts because the leakage current in the gate will increase so much that in the end the transistor will fail. In our case, because we have this auxiliary hand in front of it, it absorbs the voltage, allowing the voltage from the outside to go up to 20 volts in static conditions, and you will see up to 70 volts in dynamic uh, conditions. Um, then we have number three. Number three is a Miller clamp. This is basically, if you want half of the driver, this half, uh, half of an internally integrated uh, driver. And the Miller clamp is very important during the turn off. When the Miller clamp turns on, it pulls the gate of the power hand uh, to zero. So ensuring a very uh, effective, a very efficient uh, turn off. And it can absorb locally any DV by DT uh, currents, displacement currents uh, produced. So that allows you to have very high DV by DT uh, rating and um, also, as you will see in the next slides, also very high DI by DT rating. So uh, in a nutshell, we develop a monolithically integrated uh, solution which offers an enhanced uh, gate uh, reliability and offer ease of use because you can connect it to any gate driver without the need of any additional components on the outside. So ease of use, if you are looking at ease of use, in yellow here you see a classical hand which has a typical uh, voltage, the PGAN gate hand has a typical threshold voltage of about 1.5, 1.6 volts. We have pushed this to about 2.8 uh, free volts to give extra margin and allowing to drive the device off to zero volts and not needing any kind of negative voltage to turn off the device. We haven't compromised on the transconductance. As you can see, the, the sharpness of this curve. So we have very good transconductance compared to a standard uh, hand. And moreover, we are allowing to apply um, up to 20 volts on our chip without any need of extra external clamping uh, circuits. How we do that? If you are looking at this, we do it through the auxiliary hand, which was described uh, before, which is in itself controlled by the voltage limiter in its base and a current source. So if you look at this internal gate hand voltage is not allowed to go beyond uh, six volts, uh, in spite of the external gate hand going all the way to uh, 20 volts. It's interesting to see that we achieve a very good result, not only in, in the static conditions, but even if you have a spike on the gate, um, well in excess of 20 volts, uh, you can absorb it due to your auxiliary hand. And this is a paper which is going to be presented at APEC uh, just in one week time, and it's going to present it, be presented by um, Bishuan Wang from um, from Virginia Tech, and uh, the, the title is Exceptional Gate Over Voltage Robustness. So I want to show here that our CGD, the CGD hand, the ice gun hand, can actually tolerate uh, peak voltages up to 78 volts on the gate, as opposed to uh, classical uh, shocking PGAN hand, which can only work to 26 volts. The reason for this, again, is because we have this auxiliary transistor, which can absorb higher uh, transient voltages um, uh, during the, the overshoot in the gate voltage. Um, I think this is a, a major result because uh, typically silicon and silicon carbide power MOSFET have about 60, 70 volts. So we have achieved a result that is basically as good or if not even better than what the silicon carbide and silicon um, dynamic gate reliability is. Now, in terms of DV by DT and DI by DT immunity, as I said before, we have a Miller clamp which is locally integrated. This Miller clamp uh, is a new device. Um, we have uh, developed uh, this over the um, over a number of years, and we have patented uh, this, and we have presented it at ISPSD uh, 2022. The device. Now, I just want to show you some some results where, if we employ the Miller clamp, you can see that you reduce the oscillation during the turn off. 
And this, in particular, this second peak show in red, if it goes over the threshold voltage, if it goes over 1.5 uh, volts, it can re-trigger the transistor and it can um, give you uh, severe problems and shoot through uh, in the configuration. In, if you employ the middle clamp, you can see you reduce the oscillation and also you reduce, um, you almost uh, suppressed completely the second peak um, in the in the gate uh, voltage. So this experiment was, uh, this experiment, sorry, this uh, simulation with and without the middle clamp was done in the same condition for the same power device and the same parasitic supplied, and it was done with uh, DV body T over 140 volts per nanosecond. And indeed, in experimental results, we have passed this test of 140 volts per nanosecond. The middle clamp also helps the DI body T. Let's remember that DI body T is an oscillation in the gate a source common loop and because the middle clamp acts as a short in that loop it reduces the di by dt effect and again even at very high di by dt we can see less oscillation when using a middle clamp as opposed to not having a middle clamp now i'm going to go away from uh, ice gun technology and give you a window to the future of gun technology in power electronics and uh, i would like just to present uh, this uh, figure here where it shows multi-dimensional architecture in power devices so far we talked about the uh, efficiency, uh, the performance of the power devices being driven through change in the material from a narrow band gap semiconductor like silicon to a wide band gap semiconductor like silicon carbide or gallium nitride, and perhaps in the future to gallium oxide, diamond, aluminium nitride. Interestingly, there is um, as much um, effect or even more if you want by changing um, the architecture. We can go from one dimensional archi architectures to two dimension and three dimensional architecture, what you call the multi-dimensional device architecture to optimize uh, the device performance. Superjunction has a made, a, made a major step in that and Superjunction has not been a concept that improved to stand 20% device performance, but improved the performance by orders of magnitude. The same stack two-dimensional electron gas, putting in, in the uh, vertical dimension more of these two-deck gases, putting GAN, ALGAN, GAN, ALGAN, and creating multi-level uh, channel can also cut the on-state resistance majorly, and these technologies are in progress right now. FinFET technology applied both to silicon carbide and uh, GAN nitride will be um, uh, of uh, future, will be uh, very much present in the future, as well as the uh, trigate technologies. So what I want to show you here is that um, this development of power devices, new material should be accompanied by new architectures to take full advantage of the possibilities we have in these materials. And here is just one of these examples. Um, this has been done by uh, Virginia Tech and published at IDM uh, 2021. Here, it's an interesting type of casco technology that is monolithically integrated, whereby one single enhancement mode um, uh, channel, which is made with an insulative gate here, is driving a depletion mode hand that has multi-channel in its configuration to minimize the drift resistance um, in the device. Now, this structure here from the source to drain offers a, a resistance or specific on state resistance of 40 millionohm centimeter square for a 10 kilovolts uh, device. This is extremely impressive. And as far as I know, uh, I never seen a device uh, done at this kind of uh, voltage with such a low on state resistance. This is a world uh, record. So what I want to show you here that um, it's not going to be a simple uh, single channel uh, hemmed in the future, but very likely we are going to look at multi-channel. We are going to look at super junction applied to silicon to uh, gallium nitride, but also to some extent to silicon carbide, at least the super junction and the FinFET uh, concept. And now back to the present, what can CGD, Cambridge Gun devices can uh, offer now? Um, we have at the moment, we are offering uh, uh, three uh, parts in uh, one of them is in two packages. So in total, four products uh, listed here. So we have a 55 million uh, device, a 200 million device and 150 million in two packages. The packages we have are DFN type, DFN 5x6 for the smaller uh, device for the 200 million resistance and DFN 8x8 for the larger device, the 55 million, but also for the 130 million 
All the devices have the ISGAN interface, so they benefit from the ease of use and enhanced reliability, and we absorb any and we allow for any MOSFET uh, driver. Again, here it's important, we do not have a CAS code. We have a monolithically integrated solution. It's an e at as the power device, and there is no com complex multi-chip configuration or thermally complex integrated solution, but a single chip with embedded proprietary logic, which enables uh, the coupling with standard gate drivers and controllers. Again, our chip has a, around 2.8 free volts threshold voltage, and it can be uh, turned with a zero volts uh, turn off. There is no need for negative uh, gate voltages. And I would like to say that CGD not only just offers these devices and it is in the market, but there is uh, support for the customers throughout their design in. So we uh, have the initial device characterization, but we, we can we can also do functional tests where, for example, uh, we put uh, ice gun devices and replace uh, typical silicon or other gun uh, technologies in existing PCBs, not efficiently, uh, not efficiency optimized, but just to show as a proof of concept. But then we can also do purpose custom uh, PCB for highest efficiency and show uh, the high frequency operation. And again here, um, we have a lot of supporting materials, white paper, application notes, design guides, user guides, and please uh, look at uh, the webpage on camgundevices.com for um, more information. And please feel free to send an email to info at camgundevices.com if you need uh, more um, regarding this. Now, my final remarks uh, to this webinar, because I want to leave enough time for uh, questions and answers. Gun and silicon carbide will create a large impact, especially in fast growing markets such as data center and electric vehicles or converters for renewable energies. They will also be successful in any high end power, power conversion applications. Uh, and I have to say that GAN has a little bit more interesting uh, opportunities because of the inclusion in RF and uh, LED products and adoption in 5G applications. Our technology from CGD, ICE GAN, benefits from ease of use, enhanced gate reliability, and monolithically integrated sensing and protection functions. In terms of diamond and gallium oxide, strong theoretical candidates, but high investment costs, cost poor ease of manufacturing and low crystal wafer quality hamper their development. Nevertheless, we may see more in the future about these technologies. In regarding silicon, will coexist in some sectors with silicon carbide and gun competitors. However, its market share, at least in the 600 volts plus range, will diminish as silicon carbide and gun become uh, more mature. And this is the end of the talk. Stay tuned with us and thank you very much for attending uh, this webinar. And uh, the webinar now is open to questions. Thank you very much, Florin. Um... It was very informative, at least for me. And um, there are already a few questions in the chat. Please, everyone, feel free to post your questions in the chat. If it was specific to a specific slide, it would be nice if you mentioned the slide. Um, so, Florin, if you can go to slide 19. Okay. Um, slide 19. 19, okay. yes. There is a question. It is deleted. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next one, DV by DT, DI by DT. It is about negative voltage transient and so basically N Nigel Springett is asking how is the negative voltage transient immunity? Um, it's like excellent. We don't have a problem with the transient immunity to negative voltages and you can see here um, even in this one the um, the negative voltage is much smaller because of the Miller clamp and it's uh, reduced to very small values, but we do not have problem at all. And we tested our devices. They can easily work to up to minus six volts, even in static condition. Thank you. Um, Kengo Omori is asking, how did you achieve higher threshold voltage? Is it from gun device structure optimization or something like external circuit, which can make threshold voltage higher? So this is uh, exactly what I was uh, describing in slide in slide 16 here. Um, we first of all we have tried extremely hard to in the past during the research time in the University of Cambridge to increase the threshold voltage um, from a device structure itself. Um, this is extremely difficult 
because increasing the threshold voltage can compromise the channel resistance. So we haven't opted for any kind of um, configuration or any kind of device change, but we actually introduced this auxiliary hand which adds voltage to the gate so that um, the requirement for uh, for from the external gate is that both auxiliary hand and the power hand to be on. So the threshold voltage is increased by using this auxiliary hand here. Thank you. Any reliability life cycle tests on these devices yet from Yam yes. Sivakoti? Yes, we have done uh, reliability. Uh, they all the all the devices they've been released now in the market. They have passed the uh, reliability test. We've done HTRB, we've done HTOL, uh, we've done HTGB, and uh, we have exposed these devices to the standard conditions for hand. Um, so, uh, yes, they passed uh, all the reliability tests. And there is going to be another publication, um, hopefully in ISPSD uh, this year, if accepted, or because it's in the late uh, news uh, section, or there is going to be a presentation on specifically addressing this uh, reliability test. Thank you. A question from Bernd Smolzer. How do you see the differences between E-mode and D-mode devices? The difference between e mode, well, crucial differences is one is e mode, the other one is d mode, in the sense one has a positive threshold voltage, the other one has a negative threshold voltage. And in general, the d hand are a little bit better in the on state, and also during uh, the reverse, they offer a lower voltage drop um, on the reverse uh, operation. Um, however, I have to say that unless you use the d mode in a configuration like Cascode, um, it's of little use in power electronics. Most of the devices needing the power electronics for power conversion need to be in eventually E-mode. If that is a D-mode together with the silicon in a cascode configuration to make it to, to make it um, overall E-mode, um, then that's a different thing. But we, in general, we favor uh, a simple configuration with a single die e hand because the cascode configuration has some reverse recovery losses and the cascode configuration has also some additional problems in terms of um, putting the two dies and sharing the voltage together. Thank you. From Dudu Mohammed, what is the time leading to failure under a short circuit of 650 volt? Uh, that's a very good question. We haven't um, looked at short circuit in great detail, so I can't um, answer that um, easily. Uh, short circuit in general is limited by the by the saturation current, so obviously uh, we have an advantage in terms of the maximum uh, gate voltage that is delivered, so we climb the gate voltage a little bit lower, and also our device has a property that um, basically this uh, voltage can be, is dependent on temperature. So I do expect to see some short circuit capability to give you an endurance time. I can't give you uh, right uh, right now on the short circuit test. However, we are looking in all kinds of safe operating regime, including the short circuit safe operating area of the device, and we will publish more. We'll have a certain application notes in this area too. I do not expect to see any sort of difference with the competition, but the, on the opposite, I expect to see some benefits um, because of the ice gun robustness of the gate. Thank you. Uh, from Khan Nisar Ahmed, um, how you encounter to low thermal conductivity compared to silicon carbide? Uh, it's a fantastic question. Um, we we see, okay, um, silicon carbide does have better thermal conductivity, but let's not forget that it's a vertical device and as because it's a vertical device and uh, you need, if you couple a heat sink to the high voltage, you need to isolate. So you introduce a layer of isolation, which in itself has very high uh, thermal resistance. So the question is how much you can benefit the additional increase in the thermal conductivity of silicon carbide. Yes, you do benefit a, a bit, but in the end, all these are dictated by the packaging and the lateral technology is actually easier because it has the substrate connected directly to the heat sink as opposed to the vertical technology. So it's easier to, to have a very good heat sink attached to, um, to ground rather than to a high voltage uh, terminal. Thank you, Florin. Um, from David Nikolic, uh, slide 23, if you may go to slide 23, please. 
Okay, mm -hmm. I don't know which slide is on the free because uh, is it this one? Or this one? It shows 23. Yeah, it's this one, 23. Yeah, yeah okay. okay. <laughs> Could you please remind me the achieved R on on the multi-channel device? The achieved R on for a 10 kilovolts was 40 million centimeters square. So this is quite impressive. I have to say that uh, this, um, when it was published by Virginia Tech, it was a world record in terms of VBR square over our own, which is one of the figures of merit for power devices. Because our own was extremely small for a 10 kilovolts device. Thank you. Um, from Jenny Fang, please can you comment on PMT variations of key parameters? What does it mean PMP? I mean, PMP. Uh, I was hoping that <laughs> you would say you, you would know because I, I don't know actually what PMT is. Okay. Is Maybe it, we uh, can. Variation, process variations. Uh, process variations. Uh, well, we do have process variation in GAN. Uh, these are done in a CMOS foundry. I can uh, disclose that our devices are done at ESMC. In general, the process variations are very well under control at ESMC. And if anything, uh, if I look at one of the major problems that we have in silicon carbide is the threshold variation. If you are looking at any data sheet from Cree, from Infineon, from very uh, reputable suppliers, you will see that the threshold varies by even one volt. Given um, the very small variation that we have here, we are actually having somewhere between 2.7 and 3.9 and volts, very, very small variation in the threshold voltage. I think um, you can see that the process is pretty good. Thank you. Uh, from George Harriman, how is the cost of IC GAN devices compared to silicon comparing Apple to Apple specs? Um, a bit higher. But what GAN can deliver is, OK, so if if you are, I, I mean, I, I don't know what is Apple to Apple because, um, well, if Apple to Apple means for the same R on, what is the cost of the silicon of the GAN and the silicon? Obviously, the GAN cost is a little bit higher than the silicon. But what GAN can give you for the same R on, it can give you lower capacitance. It can give you much lower switching loss. It, it can give you uh, the possibility to operate at higher frequencies, which reduces a lot the system cost. Now, what would be the future on that? Well, my opinion that in the future, the GAN cost can go below the silicon cost. And what's the reason for that? Because GAN is still much smaller than silicon. It still has a lot of territory to grow. We are talking about today 3 million centimeters square uh, resistance are on resistance for an enhancement gun hand, but there is no reason why this can all go well below one million centimeter square, at which point the gun chip will be so much smaller for the same Aron compared to a silicon chip that you can actually break this barrier of course between gun and, and a silicon. Plus that as gun is becoming more mature, as more founders are embracing gun and uh, as the volume of uh, gun uh, suppliers is growing, then we'll see uh, the gun cost reducing dramatically. So I do expect that this equation, which now is in favor of silicon, will change in the future. But in terms of the system cost, even now, uh, systems that employ gun devices are uh, significantly cheaper than those employing silicon devices because you can shrink the form factor, you can shrink the heat sink. You don't need as much heat sink as you need for silicon because you can take advantage of the efficiency of gun. Um, a, a question from Carmen Peter. A decade from now, how do you see GAN and silicon carbide sharing or competing in different application spaces? Can GAN take more market share in high voltage, high power applications such as the drivetrain inverter? It's going to be extremely um, kind to Peter, and I'm going to say I know Peter very well, and I know he likes silicon carbide, and uh, I like silicon carbide too. And I think there are two fantastic technologies, both gun and silicon carbide. And actually in terms of their, I think they can work together to take on silicon. Um, there will be no competition in terms of the drivers for train because at 3.3 kV, I do not expect to see yet gun. There may be some, some advances in vertical gun. These are still yet to be proven, but lateral gun at 3.3 kV, I think is going to be very difficult to compete with silicon carbide. 
However, when it comes to 1.2 kV and for inverters for electric vehicles, I think this is going to be a, an area of fight between the technologies in the future. At the moment, it's silicon carbide. There is no question that silicon carbide uh, is really winning uh, in at 1.2 kV. Uh, however, in the future, we'll also see solution on GAN, and this will be an interesting area to see between the two technologies. It, it may be that silicon carbide will take a little bit on the higher power at 1.2 kV, and GAN will take on the lower pile power and higher frequencies. But I see more complementarity between the technology, the, these two technologies, than fight between these two technologies. The real fight is against silicon. Thank you. Uh, from Dietmar, uh, there's a question. How is the search capability? Uh, I don't know what search capability is because search could be a surge um, of the current, surge of the voltage. Um, in terms of the surge of the voltage, I already showed you. So the surge of the gate voltage, for example, we have uh, ice gun is doing extremely well. Um, search capability in terms of the current, it's pretty good. Surge capability in terms of dynamic uh, voltage between drain and the source. Remember that GAN has a static uh, breakdown well in excess of its rating. So we are talking about 650 volts devices that have a static breakdown of 1.1 kV. And in dynamic conditions, they can even go to 1.2 kV. So the window given to GAN is much larger than normal windows you have for silicon or even for silicon carbide. So um, if it's surge in terms of the current, um, again, I do not see any problem with GAN absorbing this kind of uh, current. Thank you. Um, a question from Gaurav Gupta. Why current developments on GAN are limited to 600 volt range? What stops GAN to reach higher voltage ranges over 3.3 kilovolt? Could GAN compete with silicon in these voltage ranges? Okay, it's a very, very good question. Um, so first of all, uh, GAN today is not limited to 650 volts. We have uh, great um, companies uh, like EPC, for example. We have also InnoScience doing much lower voltages. They can do uh, 40 volts, 100 volts, uh, 200 volts, uh, and very successfully. Um, and beyond 650 volts for higher voltages, we uh, see quite a lot of development now in the 1.2 kV area. Now, where will it stop? Well, as a lateral technology, going to very high voltage is becoming inefficient because as you increase the drift region, you also increase the area of the device. So they will become at one point inefficient. And that point is around the range of 1.2 kV, where basically a vertical technology will win. So I do not expect really to see a lateral technology going beyond 1.2 kV, even importing multiple channels. So you've seen, for example, uh, from from uh, the, the slide I show you that it, you can even have a 10 kilovolts. The question if you can actually have scale up the current in this device and be, and compete with the silicon carbide technology at this kind of uh, voltages. So I'm expecting to go to 1.2 kV. However, vertical gun is another beast, and I've seen quite some, quite a few developments in vertical gun that start competing with silicon carbide. Again, if silicon carbide um, in between the two technologies, very little because silicon carbide is also a very good competitor for vertical uh, devices. So I hope I answered your question. It's not only 650 volts, but we also have lower voltage range. We expect to move to 1.2 kV with lateral technology uh, using hemp technology. I do not expect to see it well beyond 1.2 kV. Thank you, Florian. There are actually some questions coming later on about vertical gun. But until then, um, from Nikola Deneke, do you have any info on the threshold voltage reliability? As I know from other manufacturers, this can vary a lot from die to die. Uh, it doesn't vary so much from die to die. I have to say that um, we are keeping this under under control. Uh, as I said, we have um, uh, we were based on two things. We have very good uh, control of the threshold because of uh, TSMC doing a great job on that. But also we have the ice gun technology. Part of the threshold is given by the ice gun, and that is also a very good control. So overall, we have we we can keep the threshold voltage under well under the margin we want. And I have to say, this is lower than the margin offered by, by silicon carbide manufacturers. 
Um, a question from Alejandro Palmero. Are you researching researching on vertical GAN to increase the voltage? Um, thank you very much for this question. The, the simple answer, no. Um, another question from Ian. Have you done any testing at liquid nitrogen temperatures, 63 to 70 C, 77 degree Kelvin? Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't gone to such low uh, temperatures, so I'm sorry, but we haven't uh, gone to that. We haven't looked at uh, cryogenic type devices. So the minimum we've been was minus 50 degrees, minus 55 degrees, which is according to our spec. Thank you. Um, so another question from Alatais Lay. I'm sorry if I pronounced names incorrectly, but um, is the auxiliary hemmed co-fabricated with the power hemmed? Are they on the same substrate? Absolutely. They are basically on the same chip and is the same technology. They use the same layers. It does not require any extra layers. It's part of the TSMC process. Thank you. A question from David Nikolik. Do you see stacked two degree channels device killing in the future a vertical gun device in high power application? The multi stack uh, two deck will be a very, very interesting solution. Uh, the problem with the multi-stack two deck, as you've seen, we had to use a sort of a casco technology to control multi-stack channels. So I think that the control is the issue there and how to maintain a good control. If we have a problem with maintaining a single channel, imagine the problem we have to control a multiple channel. So I still think it's it's a very challenging technology, and I think it will give some interesting uh, results at 1.2 kV. I doubt that it will help too much to very high voltages. I still think a vertical technology is better for higher voltages and higher power. A question from Ortiz Gonzalez Jose. Have you characterized the temperature dependency of the gate leakage current? What about the gun power hemp itself? Yes, we did. And it's within what our expectation is. The gate leakage increases with temperature as expected, but is well under the control. So yes, and we have our data actually shows gate leakage at higher temperature as well. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Khalid Saad. How is the performance with current source gate drivers? Um, it depends on what we, we're looking for. It's uh, given the fact that um, we have a, a resistance sensing load attached to the source of the sense hemp, then the sense hemp will um, effectively not be a perfect reproduction of the power hemp scaled down because this extra resistance will basically will have a VDS drop and a VGS uh, drop. And for this, you cannot expect the accuracy below 10% that you have. However, depends on what you are, what you want to do is more accurate at lower current and it becomes less accurate at higher uh, current. If you are interested, for example, for, for um, when the current goes to zero, as it is in our, our, some applications, it's a perfect solution. Thank you. Um, another question from Didu Mohammed. How is the reliability against repetitive, non-destructive short circuit tests? As I said, we haven't looked too much in the short circuit, so I will have to um, will have to delay that until we do more of the short circuit and the uh, short circuit safe operating area. And of course, this uh, short circuit repeatable test will be one of the important uh, yeah, application. Um, another question from Alatai Stei. Um, what's your device critical avalanche energy? Uh, it's, it doesn't have an avalanche uh, capability and we do not operate these devices in avalanche. Um, we do not have a way to absorb the holes uh, developed in gun. I think this is, by the way, this these are nothing to do with our ice gun technology. It's to do with general with gun hemp. They do not have avalanche capability, and this is one of the reasons why the avalanche voltage is taken with a, such a high margin compared to the rate rated voltage. We do not, however, expect the devices to go into avalanche. And I have to say that even in our device, uh, you will find that it's not actually avalanche limited. In fact, our breakdown, static breakdown, is not given by avalanche, but our static breakdown is given by leakage. So it's leakage limited rather than avalanche limited. Thank you, uh, Florin. I'm going to ask the last two questions, and I will take the ones related to our technology. So from Andrei uh, Mihaila, 
Could the high DVDT rates lead to EMI issues and excessive ringing? Does CGD integrated Miller clump offer any benefits here? It's a very good question. Um, the DV by DT will not directly uh, have anything to it, it. Actually, I take it back. It does have a little bit because it will lead to less oscillations. If these oscillations are responsible for EMI, yes. But there are other there are other parts in the system when operating at very high frequency that can actually generate uh, EMI. So that's more of a power electronics um, design to remove uh, the EMI. From the point of view of the device, you are you are right. The Miller clamp does help because it leads to less of, of oscillations. So let's EMI um, create it. Thank you, Florin. And the last question uh, from Miao Xin. Um, how the integrated current sense could be used for protection or for measurement? What is the accuracy of the current sensing? So the current, as I, I think this is very similar to the question I had before. The current sensing, um, if it needs a bit more sophistication to integrate a current sensing a current amplifier, you have to remember that the gun. Um, it's not ideal for integrating logic, it's not ideal for integrating uh, CMOS, and it's not ideal for integrating amplifiers um, because it has a single end channel, a very good end channel made of two DEG, but still a single end channel. So it's difficult to make complex circuits like an amplifier in GAN. If the amplification is done externally with a silicon chip, then you would expect actually very, very good results in terms of the accuracy. As it stands, as it is used now, in the, uh, what we opted in this configuration is for simplicity, where you can actually take the voltage against a resistance. But it can actually be used in a more complicated configuration by having an external amplifier. Um, an internal amplifier is possible, but is extremely challenging. And also one has to weight this against the area consumed by such an amplifier. Thank you very much, Florin. There were a lot of questions that, that we went through. Um, and I'm afraid the session is not will be open. Um, thank you everyone for joining today's session. And thank you very much, Florin. And thanks everyone for the questions. A link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to you in the coming days and it will also be available from YouTube channel, so stay tuned with us. Just before we leave, just a reminder of the next session of this webinar series will be in April. Uh, it will be with Zahid Ansari and the Vice President of CGD's operations, and we, we will take you through some steps towards quality and reliability of our devices. Uh, you will receive an invitation to this uh, session as well. And I do hope you found this session inform informative and interesting. I can see from your thank yous, from your comments, that it was very useful. Wishing you all a very good day, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon, hopefully at the next webinar session in about one month. Thanks again. Like thank to, you, everyone. I'd like to echo your comments, Nare. Thank you very much to all the people who participated. I'm very grateful, especially that for some of you, the time is quite late. And I appreciate uh, this and I appreciate all your questions. And I'm sorry if I was not able to address all the questions. And I'm sure some of you will scrutinize these questions later on and see if I'm right or not. But in any case, it was a very beautiful dialogue. Thank you. Thank you and bye everyone.